All right, well, thank, thank you very much, and it's a, it's a pleasure and it's an honor to, to be with you today. Um, and, uh, and it's an absolute joy to see my friend and uh, long-term uh, colleague, uh, Franklin. Um, we, we choose to go to the moon and do the other things. That speech, those words by, uh, by JFK, um, actually served as the activation energy to, to, uh, to, uh, to essentially extend human presence and do this absolutely remarkable thing, and that is to go to the moon uh, 50 years ago today. Um, I was a little bit younger than Franklin when that happened. I was, it was just about a week before uh, my eighth birthday and, uh, and actually stayed up late um, that night, got my folks to, uh, to let me do that. And here, give me one second. And, uh, and the, the landing actually occurred in the afternoon, of course, and then, uh, but, the, but the spacewalk itself, when Neil and Buzz actually set foot on the moon, was uh, really late, at least for a, for a seven, almost eight-year-old. Um, for me, that had a, a, a big impact, as it did lots and lots of young folks across the United States and, in fact, the world. And, um, and I'd like to tell you that that made me want, at that instant, to become an astronaut, but that's actually not true. Um, I, I, it never occurred to me as a, as a young kid that that was something that was even conceivable, just was out of the question. But from that point on, it made me just passionately interested in the space program. It made me uh, learn how to build telescopes. It made, made me learn how to grind the mirrors of, uh, of very large telescopes. And, and, uh, and it also made me follow the space program throughout my career as I was growing up. So. Um, just kind of a couple of pictures. So, of course, this was the uh, the big momentous event, and of course, a lot of things that happened before that. In fact, I was born on the year that uh, Yuri Gagarin and uh, and Alan Shepard um, flew, 1961. So, uh, the space program, as I was just a you know a baby to a toddler to a young young boy, was in its very inception. It was at the very very beginning. Um, turns out, this stuff's really hard to do. I, I thought probably as a kid in those days that by now we'd have hundreds of people living in space. And, you know, or at least maybe even hundreds living on Mars and maybe thousands living in a permanent basis in space, low Earth orbit, down on the surface of the moon. Um, it's a really, really tough thing to do, and, um, and probably it's the hardest thing that human beings have ever tried to do. Um, right now, though, we're right at the dawn of what I would consider to be the really the, the, the real start of the space age. This is the point where it actually becomes economically feasible. You know, we had always at NASA always knew that there was ways to return the first stage, the big pieces of the rocket, and land it back and not throw it away every time. Um, but the physics and uh, and all the engineering involved probably made it um, not practical in the early days, and it really took. It really took um, the gradual development of subsequent vehicles and ultimately the space shuttle to get a little bit of reusability. And then most recently, of course, with SpaceX and companies like Blue Origin as well, um, uh, figuring out a way to recover, uh, perhaps at some point, all of the pieces of the rocket. You know, the first stage, we see those uh, land on drone ships off the coast. We see them land sometimes at the beach. It, it actually makes the engineering problem a little bit harder. You've got to carry some extra gas to be able to do that. Um, but, um, but it turns out it is viable, and that's what fundamentally will, will change the calculus of uh, going to space, so it actually is something feasible. So when, when Neil and Buzz were on the moon, I, I watched them on TV like everybody else, you know, uh, 500 million people probably around the world, but I actually I really saw them for real with the binoculars. That's me on the left-hand side with the uh, corduroy pants and the knee patches, and, and, uh, and that's my sister Suzanne on the right-hand side, um, and she's got her binoculars, and then right between us is our, f our family friend, a friend long to longtime friend, uh, Neil Johnson, who I was very jealous of for, uh, for obvious reasons because he shared that name with somebody else really important. But, um, but we were really convinced that we we're actually able to see the space program. So for me personally, this was a watershed moment. It's probably probably the biggest formative event that kind of ultimately you know, uh, set me on a trajectory that got me to NASA. But again, it didn't make me want to be an astronaut. A year later, I saw this uh, silly uh, Walt Disney movie called The Boatniks. And, um, and it was about a fellow who graduates from the Coast Guard Academy and he goes out and has just a bunch of adventures and things. But from that point on, from about the time I was nine, as long as I can remember, I wanted to be, um, I wanted to go charging out in the surf in Coast Guard boats and rescue people. So that was really my, my dream that maybe I thought was a little more realistic than the, where I eventually found myself. So I went to the Coast Guard Academy and 
the very first night after doing a lot of pull, uh, push-ups with the rest of my, my new recruits, I realized as I was reading through uh, this little uh, uh, training book that told you all the things, all the missions that the Coast Guard did and all the things that if an upperclassman got in your face, you had to be ready to just, you know, tell them quickly. And I realized to my horror that the only people that can't be on Coast Guard small boats charging out in the surf saving lives are, are officers. So it's our enlisted force that actually do that. And officers, you know, don't, you know, typically go on those kinds of boats. So, so I was shocked. I mean, this is all I'd ever wanted to do. So there's a message somewhere in there about researching your career goals. Um, <laughs> but, but, but to my surprise, as I read a couple more pages past that point, it talked about the Coast Guard had C-130 airplanes. Oh, that's interesting. And they also had helicopters. And I'd never thought about aviation, but, but I realized as I read about what the helicopters do, that that, would, that was the only thing that you could, as an officer, directly participate in life-saving. You could be with a small team of, of folks, a rescue swimmer, a flight mechanic, a pilot, a co-pilot, and you can go charging out 300 miles offshore and rescue people. And, and so I'd never thought about being a pilot until then, but I never stopped. You know, my entire time at the Coast Guard Academy, that's what, what I wanted to do. So I graduated, and, um, and, and then I, I ended up doing exactly what I, what I thought. I, I went to flight school. Um, I learned how to fly Coast Guard H-3 helicopters and, uh, and H-60s. So I flew in the perfect storm um, and uh, in lots of other cases and, and, uh, and, and actually got to be part of, you know, just a really small part of a huge organization that's dedicated in humanitarian purposes to, you know, save lives and property at sea. But I continued making telescopes, and, and there's one of mine right there. And uh, then the third formative event really happened to, to me, and that was uh, this uh, Coast Guard officer and helicopter pilot named Bruce Melnick applied for the astronaut program. And I was already, I was just at my first unit, which was Elizabeth City, North Carolina, and and the, the, the shock, you know, this, my goodness, you know, somebody who flies helicopters for the Coast Guard, not necessarily a fighter pilot or something, can actually get picked up by NASA. So I made it my life's mission from that point on to every two years, send an application, usually getting denied, send another application. And on my third time over six years, interviewing each of those times, I finally got picked up. And uh, in the meantime, I got to do lots and lots of Coast Guard missions. I lived in, you know, Mobile, Alabama, in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, right here in Cape Cod, learned how to fly in fog, went up to Alaska, learned how to fly in snow, and and uh, eventually found my way to NASA. So that's kind of my, my biography from a kind of a personal sense. But, but it really, <laughs> thanks. But, but, but really, you know, there was that one crystallizing event early, early on that made me interested in, in space. And, and again, the message for the young kids in, uh, here right now and uh, that are out in our schools is, you have no idea what you're capable of. You have no idea what the future holds in store for you. Uh, Franklin had mentioned about, you know, failure is an option. That's pretty much, there's nothing I did that was ever of significant worth um, that was, uh, that I ever succeeded at the first time, regardless. And, and so I think the message to everybody is, you know, there's a tendency, you know, we try something and if it doesn't work, well, that's it. I guess that's not meant for me. I'll find another path. And that's exactly not the answer for kids. So you ought to see yourself in the future in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years designing and building spaceships, spacesuits, flying on those spacecraft, you, you know, doing spacewalks on those spacesuits. We are, again, right now at the point where we're talking about sustainable human presence in space. And by sustainable, I mean sustainable in all the positive senses, but also in the sense that we need to go there and go there to stay, to actually extend on a permanent basis uh, human presence. And it becomes economically viable, and that is what's the engine that ultimately makes us do it more often. And if we do it more often, we do it more safely. And so, so this is really the, the bright you know, dawning of the space age. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of just talk to you real quick. I, I, I shudder to talk about a, a typical space shuttle mission when I've only got two under my belt, when the most flown space shuttle crew member ever just spoke to you. But, uh, but I'll give you, I'm gonna try to give you just a little, a little flavor of what it's like to do a space shuttle mission. Um, and then I'm gonna compare and contrast that to what it's like to do an, an International Space Station expedition mission. So shuttle missions are typically one to two weeks long, you know, when we were doing those. They're very, very hectic. Uh, the crew is very focused every 
second, every minute certainly of time on orbit for a space shuttle was critical. So you had 600 people, smartest people in the world walking through the door every 24 hours at mission control, figuring out how to optimize everything you're gonna do. But you spent a lot of time and you practiced and you knew your mission inside and out and you barely knew you were in space because you were so busy. You didn't have time to really become a creature of space to adapt into what it's like to be in that environment. But, but, um, but my gosh, it was, it was absolutely incredible. There was a, at the very end of a shuttle mission, everybody's a little down in the mouth and depressed because they're having to, to return, or actually not that, they're having to leave this magical place. Um, but I would tell you at the end of a six month mission and you're configuring your currently now Soyuz, but soon we hope, your SpaceX Dragon, or, um, or uh, your Starliner, your Boeing Starliner to return after six months or a year in space station. When you're packing up all your toys and you're having to say goodbye to that magical place again, you'll feel the same uh, little twinge of depression because you're having to leave this. You're going back to your family. That's absolutely crucial. And uh, one of my crewmates, Don Pettit, would say, if you could bring your family with you up there, you might not ever have to come back at all, which is probably an exaggeration, but not a really big one. So, um, so I'm going to talk you through one of the, my last shuttle missions, and that was um, SDS-115. We were bringing up a big 35,000-pound uh, payload to essentially double the power output of space station. So this is in 2006. So crew of six in this case, we usually like to fly seven. Payload was so heavy, we couldn't actually have a seventh crew member. So we spend a lot of time training. We train in simulators. We learn how to land the shuttle, which is this really crazy, fast, very steep approach um, to a landing. And we have an airplane that we can uh, make behave like a shuttle only by having the thrust reversers, the things that slow you down in an airliner when you land here, have the thrust reversers deploy in flight, run the engines at nearly full throttle, trying to pull you backwards up the glide slope. So you're going at 300 knots, screaming at the dirt. Instead of a three degree glide path, more like a 20 degree glide path. And crews will do 500 of those before their first uh, uh, landing in a shuttle and more typically a thousand or more. Um, we have lots of other simulators to teach us about space station and about the robotic arms that we have on station and on shuttle. Um, we have new simulators right now that are teaching crews how to fly the Boeing Starliner and the SpaceX Crew Dragon. And uh, we spend a lot of time in other kinds of simulators. We learn about the spacewalk in peace. Franklin said that's the, uh, the most uh, remarkable and rewarding. I, I, I would second that. Um, when you, we don't do this very often. So this is a fundamental change in how we're going to be, we need to consider designing spacesuits and things. Right now, it's, it's certainly dangerous to put on that spacesuit and go outside the space station. Um, so we don't do it unless we really have to. So if you're a crew member on station and you don't have a planned, planned spacewalk, the whole time you're up there in the evening when an alarm goes off in the middle of the night, everybody comes pouring out of their crew quarters and we're all high five and hoping that something just serious enough for you to go outside. <laughs> but not serious enough for you to have to come home. You're hoping that you're right in that sweet spot where you get to climb in a, in a spacesuit. Um, but, but fundamentally, we need to be thinking in a different way. We need to be thinking about spacesuits that can support not just every three or four or six months going outside, but every day or at least every other day. You know, and that's, you know, spacewalk will become the norm. But, um, but it's really hard to do it. The, the spacesuit and you weigh about 500 pounds, so we usually do the spacewalks. We practice, practice them underwater where you and the suit collectively are neutrally buoyant in the water column. Um, in the shuttle days, we, we spent a lot of time in the shuttle simulator, but we also had very flight-specific training. So this mission here was the first space station assembly mission after we lost the Columbia crew. So a lot of our training and a lot of our planning and, and engineering development was geared towards how to inspect a space shuttle should there be an impact from foam or other orbital debris, how to inspect it and repair the kind of damage you'd have. So, um, and then, of course, all the spacewalk things. There's the payload we're bringing up. So again, 35,000 pounds, big as a school bus. Us, got uh, 240 feet worth of solar rays, tip to tip, that generate about 65 kilowatts of power, all tucked away in little boxes and with appendages that are all securely fastened that once we attach this, the space station will deploy and release. The shuttle would go out to the pad about uh, 30 days or so before launch, and then we would join the, the shuttle down at Kennedy Space Center um, about a week before launch. And we would get a chance to come and visit a couple times. Right before uh, launch, the night before, we would have a, typically a night viewing, and it's, and it's just spectacular to see it like that. Fueling takes place around, uh, we start tanking the external tank at about 
um, about eight or eight hours or so before launch. Um, you've trained usually for a shuttle mission um, about a year to a year and a half thereabouts. Although my first shuttle mission was a six month flow, this because of Columbia, we were signed before the Columbia accident, uh, this ended up being five years worth of training. So you have, these are your brothers and sisters, these are your family, you've spent so much time together. Okay, so this is what a shuttle launch is like. Um, these are just some kind of ballpark numbers. Sitting on the pad, a shuttle would weigh about four and a half million pounds. Landing weight's about 200,000 pounds. So there's not a whole lot that comes back, with the exception that the solid rocket boosters, we would land, they'd come down in parachutes, a ship would bring them back ashore, we'd clean them up and refuel them again. Um, each of the shuttle main engines would, and by the way, those same engines are what we're gonna use on the SLS rocket. Space Launch System rocket is the, is the deep space Saturn V-like rocket that will launch launch the Orion spacecraft to the moon and beyond. So, uh, so we actually are going to use shuttle engines for that. We'll have four of them on the bottom. They each generate about a half a million pounds of thrust. Um, the total, uh, v total thrust, when you add the solid rocket boosters, each generating three million pounds of thrust, so six plus another million and a half, you're seven and a half bumping up against eight million pounds of thrust. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic ride. Again, like Franklin said, highly recommend it. Very exciting. Um, it take, takes about eight and a half minutes to get to space, and by that I, I mean not just to get to space, but to get at that magic speed you need to be there, 17,500 miles an hour. Eight, you know, eight kilometers a second, very, very fast, so that you stay there. So the solid rocket boosters are burning, each of them five tons per second of fuel. The main engines are gobbling up a thousand gallons per second each. So if you were just ballpark, just estimate how much fuel you're burning on the way uphill, it's about 6.7 feet per gallon. That's your mileage. Yeah, that's the mileage on the way uphill. So that's, that's not the best, but that's the fact, the physics of living on an 8,000 mile rock called planet Earth. But then when you get to space for a shuttle mission, you're gonna spend 10, 15 days or so orbiting the Earth very, very fast with low burn rate. So you're gonna get a mission gas mileage of about eight miles per gallon. Okay, so here's what a launch is like. So this is the vehicle. We would start the shuttle main engines about six seconds before launch, let them throttle up, and the computers on board check them out. If everything is all good, and you'll see an inset, that's us, and that's me on the, on the foreground left side. So there's a little bit of motion with the solid rocket boosters. At, at the end of six seconds, if all is well, we light the solid rocket boosters, and you can see us bouncing around there. You almost can't read the instruments. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty exciting ride. So you basically are going about 100 miles an hour by the time the tail clears the pad. So the thrust to weight ratio is, rel is very, very high relative to a Saturn V, for example. And uh, by 43 seconds, we're going through the speed of sound, so you can see the shock wave kind of build up around the vehicle. The solid rocket boosters are doing most of the work, and they're going to be empty at about uh, two minutes in. So there's the, uh, the shock waves building up. Um, and as soon as they're empty, we basically will jettison those because we, they're just at that point dead weight that would prevent us from getting uphill. So there's a view from the solids looking at the rest of the orbiter headed uphill with the three main engines doing all the work now under the power of the liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen coming out of the external tank. So it's shocking how smooth the ride is once the solids are gone. Solids just burn in a very you know, sort of chaotic, very high vibration sort of way. But uh, under the space shuttle main engines, it's, uh, it's really, really smooth. After Columbia, we would do uh, as soon as we disconnect from the external tank, because it's just going to tumble and burn up in the atmosphere, we would do a very, very quick, almost immediate backflip, 180 degrees, so that we could look out the uh, overhead windows and take very, very close-up pictures. So it's the the external tank looks about as close as the back of the of the wall is here. You know, back in the day, we would get the external tank further away before we would do that maneuver. But it, it got you high enough resolution imagery to know that there was no missing foam, for example, that might have been a problem. This is what the station look like. It's much bigger than that now, but that's what it looked like when we got there. There's one set of solar rays. We're bringing up a second. This is the crew that's there waiting for us. Um, uh, it, what they're doing there, and they're smiling and happy, but what they've spent the last several days doing is lashing everything down just strapping stuff down, you know, really, really securely. Um, when you're an expedition crew member, you get very efficient at uh, living and working in space. And even when veterans crew members, you know, first dock to station and cross the hatch, they're clumsy. They're, they're just like bowling a china closet and thing. they're bouncing off the walls and everything is coming loose. You can generally find them because there'll be a, a, a trail of debris behind them. So you gotta kind of just doing slow rolls. So, so 
uh, so this is uh, Jeff Williams in the front left there, Pavel uh, Vinogradov in the front right, and Tomas Ryder in the back. And we, in two days, will catch up the station, we'll dock to it, and it's this very, very small, tenuous sort of attaching mechanism between the two, and there's a tunnel that we can go back and forth from station, so that's a, that's a view. Um, we immediately get to work, and we're going to use the space station's robotic arm, but first we're going to pick this 35,000-pound payload out of the payload bay with a shuttle arm, and then we're going to present it to the station arm, use that, and then attach the, uh, the payload um, to, the, to the outer part of the, uh, the truss. So that's Steve McLean getting ready to fly the station arm, and I'm firing up the space shuttle arm. And then we're going to do this extraction. Now it's a little bit like the, that game operation where you're trying to pick up the funny bone. And there's only about an inch and a half of clearance on the sides of the payload from like important stuff like this is a, a orbiter boom sensor system on the right hand side there. So you've, in the shuttle arm flies beautifully. We very carefully lift this up. It's kind of a fairly slow affair, but, but you want to be real careful. We're also very, very close to space station structure there as well. And then uh, it basically rolls over the, uh, the port uh, payload bay edge there, the sill. And then there's another grapple fixture. You can see that's on the right-hand side, uh, kind of center height. And then Steve grapples to it with the space station robotic arm, which is a much bigger one. Both of these are uh, Canadian contributions to the space station and shuttle. And then we basically attach it to the structure. Now, inside, we can issue commands that will actually drive motorized bolts that will mechanically attach it. But then we've got a lot of work to do to go outside and connect all of the, the nervous system and the, uh, and the vascular system, if you will, to that. So that's what it looks like when it's all done. And the, the very next day, we start doing spacewalks. So it's a, several days of spacewalks to go and do all the activation to to uh, basically get the solar rays and the radiators on that payload ready to, to extend. Um, it, it's, it's, the first thing that strikes you when you do a spacewalk, I don't know, frankly, if you feel the same way, but, but every time you've done this, and you probably have done it 10 to 1, maybe 15 times to every spacewalk you do on the real day, you, you, you go out the airlock in the pool, and there's a cloud of divers, and they're really smart, and they know exactly what you need to do. And, and on the real day, there's nobody. They, they just don't show up for work that day. And, <laughs> And, 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 and the place you're going to, unlike in the old days where you're always like 55 feet away from the shuttle airlock, we go one heck of a long way away from the airlock on station. We could be 300 feet plus away from, from home plate. So, uh, but, uh, but anyway, so, so we go out there, we connect uh, the umbilicals that route the power and the data, and there's uh, cooling system fluids that are there as well. And then we have to mechanically open the, uh, the blanket boxes that, that actually in, you know, contain those 240 feet worth of solar rays. And, uh, and every now and then, if you get a little bit ahead, the ground, uh, you, you have a chance to kind of enjoy the view a bit because, because uh, the ground's kind of catching up maybe to what you're doing. But it's a real busy time. And, uh, and there's our spacesuit. Um, yeah, almost life size. So, so it's a it's a spacecraft, and, and Sue Curley is going to be here a little little bit later. Oh, there she's here. She just walked in, and Sue's going to tell you about that, and then about some plans for future spacewalks. But you carry all your tools in the front with you as well. It's got a little jet backpack on the back. So, should you become detached to station through inattention or hardware malfunction, you have a way to actually deploy a little hand controller and then fly yourself back to space station, kind of like a parachute. Um, but it's, uh, but it's fantastic. So you can grab a million pounds of space station and just kind of stuff it behind your back if you get a quiet moment. And then there's nothing human made in your field of view and you're just flying over the Himalayas at, at uh, you know, 17,500 miles an hour like Superman. It's just absolutely spectacular. So, and that's the view from Atlantis once we've got everything attached and the blanket blocks are, de are, are deployed and now we're ready to, the next day, we do all this inside. We actually issue commands and there's motors and, and mechanisms that'll actually pull out those blankets and, and uh, that's one set of them and they go long way the other direction as well. And again, they make about 65 kilowatts of power. So a little bit about living in space on space station on a shuttle mission. You just have a couple of days, you know, where there's things settled down enough for you to have a meal and kind of celebrate the things you're doing. And uh, the crew hosted us for that. There's some just habitability things, house cleaning kinds of things you do in space, uh, space shuttles, which are not so critical. But on space station, they're absolutely a must. We spend a, our, essentially our whole Saturdays tidying things up there. Um, we sleep kind of hanging like bats upside down, side, sidewise or what have you, in uh, sleeping bags. The, the mission can be so busy that on a shuttle mission, you might be lucky to get five hours of sleep on a night, typically. 
Um, when you do have some spare time, everybody just makes a beeline for the windows because you know the, the views of planet Earth are the thing that's that's uh, that's so striking. So everybody's fighting for uh, window space. You might get a chance to see Mount Etna or some other volcanoes. You might get a chance to see home. And uh, there's our Cape and Islands and Boston kind of to the left and a little bit to the right. And that it's kind of an interesting shot because there's some sun glint. The sun is reflecting off of the ocean and you can see the Labrador currents coming from the north and the Gulf Streams coming up from the, uh, from the lower left here from the south and they interact and create these eddies that are, that are pretty spectacular. We had a little bit extra gas so we uh, did a quick lap around Mars. Um, but, <laughs> But, but actually, you know, it, it, there are some times, like we're, we're a water planet mostly, but then next to that we're a sand planet. So there's lots and lots of desert, and that's pretty striking sometimes. But, but, uh, and that's what everything looked like from the very back window of Space Station looking forward to Atlantis, which is up there in the, in the, uh, the right-hand uh, background there. And then we left. We very shortly thereafter, there's not enough, actually there's not enough hydrogen and oxygen to power the electrical system on shuttles. So shuttle delimiter was the amount of power you could make. And uh, on space station, power is almost kind of free. So we, we get it once we have the solar rays up there, courtesy of the sun. And uh, we left it a little bit asymmetrical, but another crew squared that away very shortly thereafter. And then you land, and, uh, and it's been this whirlwind thing that, you know, experience that maybe you don't even remember all the things that happened because it was so busy. Uh, we're a little wobbly when we land after a two-week mission, and, you know, frankly, we're a little more tired, I would argue, than we are after a six-month mission on shuttle missions because the, the tempo of operations almost doesn't really allow you to do the exercise that, that humans really need to do in space to prevent all the the uh, deleterious effects of space. But on space station, it's a priority. So two and a half hours a day, crews are exercising an hour and a half of that strength and one hour of that um, uh, weight training, I mean, uh, a cardiovascular training. So I'm gonna give you a kind of quick ISS expedition, just kind of talking the, the comparing and contrast the differences, and I'm gonna shamelessly regale you with some uh, pictures from space. So on a shuttle mission, we don't get enough time to really get good at the cameras. It kind of takes about a month or two in, uh, on a space station mission before you really get good. And we've got great cameras, and they can take pictures all by themselves once you set them up nicely. So uh, I've got a few that other crews have, and then a whole bunch that we took. All right, so there's our mission. Uh, that was the one that I was a commander of, Expedition 30. We launch with the Soyuz crew. Uh, it's a crew of three these days. When we launch on commercial crew soon, it'll be uh, probably a crew of four, typically. So it'll be two U.S., um, probably a Russian, and then a, another international partner from station uh, from the ISS program. That'll, that'll fly on those as well. But a Soyuz um, is is a really small relative to a space shuttle, shockingly small vehicle. So we are a long ways away from each other relative to how we'd have to be in the Soyuz. So you're just gonna be completely wedged against each other. You're gonna have straps over your shoulders and you're gonna have a waist strap as well. Um, and then you're gonna have each of your knees will be tied to your chest. You'll be in a little tiny human cannonball for, uh, for, uh, for a good long time. Um, when you get to station, you're gonna, you're gonna meet up with another crew of three from another Soyuz that's already there. You'll overlap a bit for them and then halfway through your mission, typically another crew will come up. Um, so we, uh, we, Expedition 30 had all those folks there. So my Soyuz crewmates, Anton Shkaplerov and Anatoly Venetian are behind me there. And then Oleg uh, Kononenko is, uh, is on the right-hand side foreground. Don Pettit behind him towards the right. And Andre Kuypers of, uh, of the Netherlands is uh, in the center in the back there. So a crew of six is usually what we have on station these days. Um, so... Training flow for a, for, a, for a shuttle mission was very, very focused on you know, a lot of time in the simulator, a lot of time practicing spacewalks, all the operational things you can do so that you can do them flawlessly, essentially, and be pretty much ready to, uh, to do anything, including the, the anomalies and the, the contingency kind of planning. Space station training is a whole different affair. You know, with a million pound mass space station and six months you're gonna spend up there, we don't have the ability to train to the level of detail on every task and subtask you're gonna do. So we do what's called skills-based. We just give you a lot of theory. You'll do just a handful of simulations instead of doing maybe 
you know, 500 ascent and entry runs on a, for a space station or a space shuttle flight, you might do maybe a couple of dozen, and then you'll maybe do two or three all day uh, um, life aboard space station kind of simulations. But you go up there with a lot of understanding about how the space station works, and uh, you're essentially going to just take care of things and learn as you go and do things in a little bit more measured pace. But for the vehicles that get you to and from station, we always have to worry about survival training. On station, we worry about the big three, which are fire, uh, depressurization, and then uh, a toxic atmosphere re release, so perhaps ammonia or something like that. Um, Shuttles we launch when the weather's great, not just at Florida, but they're great across in, in Europe at our uh, transatlantic abort sites. Um, rockets don't much care a whole lot about the weather. The reason why we like the weather to be good in the shuttle was if you ever had to come back because something happened on the way uphill, you wanted to be able to land in good, clear conditions. Um, with a capsule, it doesn't really matter. You're going to come back wherever you come back. The rocket doesn't care about snow, blizzards, or all the rest. And, and uh, so this was when the weather broke where you could actually see. Um, but when we first got to the base of the rocket, and by the way, there's a crew right now, the Expedition 60 crew is in a rocket just like this um, down in Baikonur in Kazakhstan. And uh, at the end, in, in about, yeah. Miko for them, that is insertion with the vehicle with them safely in orbit will be exactly one hour from now. So there'll be a little chance, maybe we can, we'll, we'll actually get to watch their launch if you like. Um, but anyways, so we, you'd show up there and you'd, you'd climb aboard the, uh, the vehicle and as long as you had uh, two meters of visibility across the capsule, that's good enough and we're gonna launch this. So there's the view of you in the, the Soyuz, and, and again, you are absolutely wedged against each other, and, uh, and if you had any tendency towards claustrophobia, um, uh, this would not be the vehicle for you. And, and, it, and if you're an old guy with, with kind of some sore joints and things like that, at the end, when you finally get to unstrap and unpeel, you know, unfold yourself from the seat, um, it, it's a long process and a little bit painful, but, but uh, you're going to a great place. So we spent two days in that vehicle, and that's, I think that's life size, so it's about that big, you know, maybe <laughs> slightly bigger. Um, but it's a nice little sports car, and, uh, and the place you're going to is just magnificent. That's space station now, and uh, anything but life size. Again, big as a football field and a million pound mass, and, and so big that while you're up there, sometimes you might spend 45 minutes trying to find one of your crewmates because they're somewhere in this giant rabbit warren of laboratories and, and airlocks and other kinds of things. Just a wonderful place. So since you've been in the Soyuz, this is even bigger still. So again, that's, that's roughly what you're looking at, almost a million pound mass. There's the velocities. I'm going to give you the, the uh, not the SI units here, 250 miles above Earth and, uh, and uh, a decent amount of power, but we're going to need a whole bunch more to, to get ourselves quickly to the destinations we're really aiming for. This is an atypical I would say not really a typical day, but we do a lot of operational stuff on station in kind of spurts. You know, there'll be a cluster of activities associated with an EVA, a spacewalk. There might be a, a lot of training and preparation and then some pretty exciting robotics work leading up to um, the arrival of a cargo vehicle that you might have to catch, snatch out of, you know, out of thin air, so to speak, very thin air, and, uh, and dock it to station. Um, but uh, most of what we do on station typically is the science that station was built for. So some of the operational kind of things, again, the station crews, so there's a crew on board right now that's lashing things down, getting ready for this crew that's going to dock uh, later on. And, uh, but uh, but they're, they're also going to be monitoring that entire approach as that Soyuz does dock, uh, bringing up Drew Morgan, Alexander Skvartsov, and Luca Parmitano. Um, here's one of the cargo vehicles. This is a, a Japanese HTV, so it's coming up full of about uh, 6,000 pounds of cargo. And this one comes up all by itself. So it's got an automated uh, uh, rendezvous and uh, guidance system. And as it gets close to the very back of station, just before docking, um, it's very, very, uh, the, the motion control system very active to very precisely constrain the trajectory and rates and stuff as the vehicle comes in. You're monitoring this on a, on a TV screen and you also have lots of telemetry and you're hoping maybe it'll misbehave a bit so you can, you can take over and fly it in manually, but uh, usually they do just fine. And uh, some of the vehicles, though, are designed to come up and just rendezvous in Flywood Station and then you, you catch them with the station's robotic arm. So, uh, 
Actually, I, I misspoke. That last one was the uh, European Automated Transfer Vehicle. This is the Japanese HTV, which is, is designed to come up like the SpaceX Dragon and the Northrop Grumman Cygnus comes up, and then it uh, ends up outside your window and you catch it in flight like this. Some of the other operational things, again, that never happens quite enough for any of us is uh, uh, the spacewalks, and it's an all-hands affair. Everybody on station supporting that crew that's out there, and then people all around the world in mission control centers that are doing it as well. Um, a lot of the station, a lot of the time you spend really is doing science. So uh, this is a combustion physics experiment I'm getting ready to do. And um, we learned some interesting things about how uh, things combust in microgravity. And um, it's always fun to be able to do a, a, an exper a experiment with fire. We do some other basic kinds of science that include some basic uh, fluid uh, physics experiments. So this one's called the capillary flow experiment. And uh, the inset there on the right-hand side kind of shows uh, uh, up close what uh, Joe Acaba is seeing there. Um, we do our own. We always play with our food, so we do kind of our informal um, amateur experiments all the time. It's irresistible. Um, some of the uh, work we do on station is uh, maturation of different kinds of engineering technology. So we had a robonaut uh, up there for quite a while, and we did the initial checkouts on that robot. Um, it's not often that a payload actually becomes a part of the crew. So we actually had robonaut doing things that humans aren't particularly good at or get very bored with. And, uh, and basically, with this probe, robonauts having to measure very, you know, about 30 different positions what the velocity and, and uh, mass flow rates were for, uh, for the uh, part of the air revitalization system. We do a lot of life sciences. A lot of the work that uh, the NASA-based research on ISS is geared towards trying to figure out how to keep humans safe and healthy in space so that we can responsibly say, yes, we're ready to send them to Mars, powered by a Vasmir rocket. Um, some of those aren't the most pleasant. This was my, the bane of my, my time on station, which is the, um, it's a VO2 max experiment that we're uh, basically doing on a, on a vibration isolated cycle ergometer. And uh, just it take, took so long to get set up and it was really, really hard work up there. Um, we actually are studying how the, the brain adapts and, and uh, you know, you become a creature of, of three dimensions. Your ability to navigate in three dimensions actually has a step function improvement about uh, three to four weeks into the mission and, and understanding how that all happens is interesting. Here's one thing that we do in space right now that we never used to do, which I think is kind of a big deal. Um, in the history of the U.S. space program, whenever we would fly spacecraft, we'd fly them for a short period of time, and if there were capsules, we'd bring the capsule back, and we would give it to a museum or, or, or what have you, but, but uh, you, there w it would, you'd be flying a new piece of hardware. And uh, when bad things happened, as they would occasionally would with Apollo 13, for example, you would have a lot of smart people on the ground talking you through a way to adapt, for example, in that case, the lunar module's environmental control system to, to allow that crew to have just enough oxygen and just enough CO2 scrubbing and just enough power to be able to make a free return lap around the moon and then safely return to Earth. But generally speaking, things typically, you know, bad things don't very often happen, but again, you're flying new hardware. Um, in the case of the shuttle gears, you would fly an essentially new piece of hardware that had been under the love and care of uh, a whole team of engineers and technicians who were the, kind, the, the very same people or very, you know, trained to the same level of people that actually built those vehicles. So you would fly it new, you'd fly it for a couple of weeks, and you'd bring it back. So if you're going to be, if you're going to be Scotty, if you will, on Star Trek, if you were going to be a repair person for the shuttle, we would give you a PowerPoint presentation, about 45 minutes of lectures. We'd show you some of the tools. You probably can't touch them, and it's going to be good enough because in the end, duct tape, for the most part, would solve a lot of our problems. Um, and, uh, but on Space Station, early on, we said, well, it's big, it's been up there for a while, maybe we should do two PowerPoint presentations and they can actually touch the tools, but uh, maybe we, we don't let them actually do anything with those. So we were discovering that when you have a million pound mass of Space Station that's been up there for 20 years with nobody that's a professional technician or engineer, tending to it with just lots of pilots and physicians and scientists, it wasn't necessarily the best solution to train them that way. So we, on our crew, basically rewired the space station and, and put a, you know, a high bandwidth, a high, high rate of fiber optics um, backbone on it. We spent 
some time, and this is some of that work right there. So you do spend about 25% of your time upgrading or repairing station. Um, we have a different set of standards for confined space, you know, sort of activities for those of you that are familiar. So you can get into a really, really small place. It may be hard to see them, but there's uh, Don Pettit's uh, face right there behind one of our water purification racks. We had a problem with, with that rack where we had to actually do something that would have horrified all the engineers where we actually took apart or took the cover off of a catalytic reactor, which is like an ultra clean kind of piece of equipment. This basically is what turns urine or wastewater from spacesuits or humidity from the atmosphere when you were sweating, working really hard on, the, on your exercise equipment or today's coffee ultimately and we turn it into tomorrow's coffee. So we purify all the wastewater. So the space station has got a very, very sophisticated and very successful water processing system that makes us uber recyclers. You have to be though if you're gonna if you're gonna be in space. But we were doing repairs, things far beyond what you would expect crew members, even if they were mechanical engineers with a lot of, you know, design experiments experience to be able to do. So when, when I came back, so when you come back from a mission, you get three wishes, basically. The program will listen to your top three things you would fix, and the number one one for me was we need to fundamentally change how we, how we train crews. So what we do right now, people that fly in space station all don't just get a couple of PowerPoint presentations, but they go to work on the T-38 little jet airplanes that we fly, and they work, they start out in the flight line, they're servicing jets, they're working with the, the technicians that work on those, they end up in the engine shop, the hydraulic shop, they're doing avionics, troubleshooting on, the, uh, on those airplanes, and frankly, they're using the exact same tools and basically the exact kinds of techniques that we need on, on the space station to take care of it. So, so it turns out that that ends up being pretty successful. Exercise, again, is a really important part of what you do. So you're running um, or you're on the cyclergometer an hour a, a day and you're an hour and a half of uh, strength training. Um, just living in space, you know, we ha we'll try our best, even though everybody's very busy, we try our best to sit down and have meals together at the end of the day. Um, this is a rarity if you actually get ice cream up there. Uh, maybe it's a little better these days, but sometimes in the shuttle missions, we would actually bring up some ice cream to the crew. Um, other living in space, we promise each other before we fly, you never had to get a haircut on a shuttle mission or, or probably the, uh, the Apollo, Gemini, or Mercury missions either. But if you're going to be up there for six months or a year like Scott Kelly did, you're going to need to get haircuts. We promise each other we'll practice with the Clippers. We never do. We, we, we're pretty good pilots. We're pretty good engineers and scientists. But we are absolutely terrible barbers. And it goes from like one slip and a mistake to another. And then... <laughs> In, invariably, the, the whole crew is, is uh, bald shortly thereafter. So, so you'll see periodically where suddenly the crew's all wearing ball caps or they're just, you know, they're looking like that. And that's exactly what just happened. So, so we, we get to celebrate a couple of holidays during that six months. Again, it's fairly busy time, but we do get a day and a half typically off on the weekends. And then those holidays are real precious times. A thing that's really fundamentally different than what we did back in the shuttle days is you get to talk to your family anytime you want. You call them anytime you want. You get to see them once a week on the weekends, which is, which is really good. And then for holidays, there's are other opportunities as well. They can watch you on NASA TV all the time if they can stand that. So you, you, you have a level of connection with with your family that you're able to do on a long duration mission that we never really accommodated back in the earlier days. We have a guitar up there um, and we've had flutes and all kinds of other musical equipment. There's a keyboard still up there from one of the early expeditions. And we all, regardless if we started out as amateur photographers, we all become that very quickly. So we've got these great cameras. Um, typically in the cupola, which is our little window on the world, it's a bubble that's in the, on the uh, belly of the orbiter, uh, belly of the space station, we'll have usually, what we would do in ours is we would have four cameras all rigged and ready for daylight imagery and the other four cameras all set to go for night. And sometimes they will, they have an intervalometer where they'll just take a shot very, very quickly and they're able to, they're able to, um, very, uh, in, in a very fast fashion, you know, put together a, a, one of these um, Aurora, uh, pictures, time-lapse pictures, or these Aurora movies sometimes that we'll do. So we took about a half a million pictures on board during our six months of time. So if you, if you drop the pixel every time there was a picture taken on the first 29 expeditions or 28 expeditions on station, that's what it would look like. If you dropped a pixel every time at the end of hours, you can almost make out planet Earth. Now, when I say we took the pictures, actually the cameras, we program them, they're set up and they're kind of taking those um, more or less many times on their own. So that's planet Earth. Um, this would be the view out your window in the morning, sipping a, from a bag of Kona coffee or something. 
And um, you have very few places in planet Earth that look quite like the Caribbean. And there's Florida, top uh, right there a little bit. Um, just, I'm just going to kind of go through these quickly because this planet is spectacularly beautiful. And every now and then you'll get an opportunity. This was not our, our mission, but uh, another expedition. You'll have these fortuitous opportunities to, to image, you know, significant events here on planet Earth. And, you know, we think of deserts as being kind of boring and monochromatic. And this is part of the, Aust the Australian outback, just gorgeous, uh, uh, you know, dried lake bed. Um, th does this look like a ridgeline to you or does it look like a canyon? So this is, I'm going to flip that picture upside down. How about now? That's a canyon, right? Is that a canyon? And, and this is the exact same picture. Um, it's, it's part of the Grand Canyon, actually. We, because, of, because we live here on planet Earth, the sun's usually up there. The bright stuff, even in, in buildings and stuff, is usually up there. If there's a concave feature, and, this, and the lighting is from above, as it typically is for Earthlings, then the dark, the dark of the concave is on the top part of it, and the light part of the concave is on the bottom. So it makes us predisposed to see a concave feature that's got light on top and dark at the bottom as something that's actually convex, poking out at you. It's just, it's just a byproduct. It's the exact same picture. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the exact same picture, but it's just a byproduct of, of the biases that we've evolved to, uh, to have by virtue of being, you know, earthlings. Every now and then you get lucky and there'll be something like this. This was a comet Shoemaker-Levy in uh, 2011. And this was our companion for, you know, for weeks, just this gorgeous, uh, gorgeous view. We could take pictures of it in IR and in visual. Um, this is kind of a neat picture. This is um, zodiacal light. So the moon is there in the top center. Um, the Hawaiian Islands, you're looking at the Pacific, Hawaiian Islands are there on the right-hand side, and there's a hazy glow that's sort of offset from the reflection of the moon off of the Pacific, and that is actually in the plane of the ecliptic, the plane of our solar system. So it's basically all the hazy bits of grains of nanoscale particles that are forward scattering. The sun's about to come up, so they're reflecting off of that. And they're all the stuff that were just too far away to coalesce and form a sun or Jupiter or Earth or you and me. So this is kind of like the primordial material that formed our solar system. Um, these are three shots left to right. You know, we typically down here see um, shooting stars, if you will, or meteors against a background of stars from planet Earth. In space, you see it. Um, you basically re-enter in the atmosphere below you against a background of city lights. Um, Earth's history is one of catastrophe on a geologic scale anyways. This is a fairly small crater in Chad, and there's a really big one, a 100-kilometer one, that's, that's up in Canada called Manicouagan, and there's a close-up of it. So the center portion of that was probably molten for 10 years, and this was a really bad day for North America 200 million years ago. That stuff happens. Um, so if, if, if we took, use those long lens cameras and stacked a bunch of images, this would be what Manhattan would look like during the day or at night. And you can pick out Central Park, probably. And you can you see the lights of Times Square and that part of Manhattan pretty clearly as well. There's a city in, uh, in Europe. Yeah, London. Okay. And, and again, some desert shots. This is part of uh, the Namib Desert, Namibia. So there's very few human-made structures, single structures that you can actually see from space. And, and this is, of course, zoomed in. But these are the Great Pyramids. And they're right at the western edge of Cairo, which is at the apex of the Nile River Delta. And if you know where to look and the sun is just risen, they'll cast a shadow across the, uh, the desert. And you, it'll draw your eyes in. And naked eye, you can actually pick them out. They don't look quite like that unless you have a camera. But you can't see the Great Wall of China. It's, uh, it matches the sand around there, the, and, and it's sinuous. We, we've seen linear features much, much more readily. Um, we'll see you know, sandstorms over the Western Sahara. Sometimes there'll be sand that'll lay up in the atmosphere like this in southern Pakistan, or southern Iran and Pakistan for weeks at a time. And you're just wondering, marveling, how people could actually survive underneath there. Um, we talk about glaciers as being rivers of ice, and on a long enough time, time scale, they, they are, they do flow. Um, and, uh, but you can, if you stand back far enough, you can get a sense that they're, of how fluid they are. Um, for, the, 
for the mechanical engineers and aerodynamicists in the world, we can, on a flow bench, we can create what's called a, a, a von Karman vortex street, or these alternating clockwise and counterclockwise swirls on a flow bench in a laboratory, just had, sending streamlines of bubbles, and then stick a bluff body or a circular thing in the way, and it'll cast those. And that's like on a couple meter scale. Or you can step back and fly over, you know, just south of the Aleutian chain, and you'll see same streamlines at the very top there, coming off the Alaska Peninsula, hitting two big volcanoes, and on a couple of thousand mile scales, see that same phenomenon. Um, and the auroras are just spectacular. Um, and so this will happen periodically, especially if the sun has a coronal mass ejection or a solar particle event, things like that. But with those same cameras, if you open up the shutter for a while and just let them you know, stay open and just do a time lapse picture, you might see this. So the yellow streaks are basically the sodium vapor lights of cities. Some of the greenish hues are the mercury vapor lights that are common in some places. And all those little blotches are lightning flashes. And then you've got that 100 kilometer um, band of, uh, of Earth's atmosphere that's excited uh, in UV. You've got a little bit of zodiacal light, that haze in the, the top right. And here on planet Earth, if you want to do circular star trails, you would point your camera, you know, if an astronomer, point your camera at the north uh, star or the south celestial pole and leave the shutter open for a while. On station, it generally flies belly towards the Earth with the solar rays on the left and right side, kind of like an airplane. And uh, so what you have to do is just point that camera out the left or right side of the truss and uh, you're getting an artificial set of, of, uh, of uh, star trails that way. There's with the fisheye lens in the cupola, that, that great window on the world, with a little bit of aurora there in, the, in uh, some places. The, the striking thing to me is that, you know, we have a planet of 7 billion people, and from the vantage point of 250 miles or 400 kilometers, unless you know where to look, it's not, if it's daytime, it's not even clear that there's anybody here at all. You know, and, and yet we know that we are straining the resources. We are, we are creating all kinds of problems for ourselves all around the planet. And, and those 7 billion people come with a, with a pretty significant burden. There's a that tiny sliver of, of, uh, of uh, kind of blue fuzz on the top that, that follows the arc of the Earth is, you know, the part that's habitable. It's just, you know, that's the envelope, this tiny envelope of air, which on scale is probably like the skin of an apple. And that's everything we have. And, and everybody you've ever known and everything that's ever happened in planet Earth and the people that designed and built rockets and all that lives there in that one thin little envelope. And we have all of our collective eggs on that, that, uh, that basket called planet Earth. Um, we ought to fix things here, but we ought to also go elsewhere as well, I think. So the only time, if you've took that same view, the only time you can really see in a stark terms, you know, that people live here is if you took that view and just turn the lights out, put the sun on the other side of the earth, and then you see all the population centers, you know, all lit up with electricity, just like Franklin was saying how that, that happened over the time period of, of his career. You could see it um, across the planet Earth. So we did a little photo. This, we're, we're about ready to pack up our toys and come home for Anton, Anatoly, and myself. And we climbed back. And this is the same picture as the launch day. But uh, so it's actually worse than this because we're carrying a bunch of payloads, things that we're bringing down with us. And unfortunately, we're two inches taller than when we started. So if it wasn't already really, really tight and cramped, it's, uh, it's that much more so. You get one last little view of your home for the last six months, and then a crazy fiery ride in a capsule, which Scott would say is like uh, going over Niagara Falls in a, in a barrel on fire. Um, <laughs> and, and, it, and it is wild. It is so, it's a, such a different affair than it, than it is coming in on a space shuttle, which is, which is you know, nice and benign. and. Uh, smooth, um, but then eventually the parachute opens and, and it's a nice lazy descent after that, punctuated at the very bottom by uh, the soft landing jets, so-called soft landing jets, and then a, uh, a, a 20 G impact as the belly of the, the vehicle hits the, uh, the, uh, the yeah, it's a field basically in Kazakhstan. Now, the interesting thing to me is that on the instrument panel of a Soyuz, there's a light that says Posadka, which is Russian for landing. If there's one thing that you do not need to have information on, it's the fact that you have just landed. Nothing could be, I mean, there, there's no mistaking, you know, that, that landing. So, so we get carried out kind of like the Sultan there, and, uh, and, and you're really, really happy to be back, and gravity is just try, trying to turn you into a, a puddle of protoplasm. 
Um, we get a chance to call home shortly thereafter, and then within a day, we're back in uh, Houston, and I'll talk about that in a second. We're back in Houston and we're with our families. Interestingly, like I said, we exercise a lot more in space station than we did on shuttle, so there is a handful of times my whole life when I could do 20 pull-ups, and one of those was the day that we got back uh, 24 hours after we landed, and because we do, we spend so much time exercising on station because it's so critical. So we can protect from uh, loss of muscular strength, we can protect really for the most part for bone loss as well, which was deemed to be the, sh the showstopper for the longest time from a, a life sciences standpoint for deep space missions. Um, our heart does shrink about 25%, the stroke volume, so we actually take a hit in, in our cardiovascular conditioning, but it comes back at about 40, 45 days or thereabouts. So, but uh, f I could squat more, I could bench more, and I could, like I say, do, and I can't do 20 pull-ups anymore, but I could that day. So that's a long duration mission. Um, there's a whole bunch of, I'm gonna, I'll go just quickly through this because I want to have just a, a few minutes for questions too. Um, we're building two new spacecraft, uh, courtesy of uh, Boeing and SpaceX. This is the SpaceX Crew Dragon, so it's got its own rocket. And uh, the Boeing Starliner, which, is got, which launches on an Atlas V rocket, both of those we hope by the end of the year um, to be transporting crews on, uh, you know, to and from space station so that we're not dependent upon just the Russian Soyuz that we have dissimilar redundancy and access to space. Um, at the same time, that allows NASA to put its resources into the Orion capsule here and uh, the corresponding SLS rocket, which would launch it. So it's akin to the to the Saturn V. A lot of repurposed shuttle hardware, including the solid rocket boosters, but these are stretch versions with about 25% uh, longer length. So they, they've got, uh, they burn hotter and can lift more. And then it's got four space shuttle main engines at the bottom there as well. Um, this is the view you have from space station right now. This is the view we want and Ultimately, I think this is a view that we hope to be treated to from imagery on board um, the, the vehicles that will go to the moon in 2024. So that first mission 2024 that NASA is targeting, which will be the first woman and next man to go to the moon, it's going to go to a very special place too. It's going to go to the south pole of the moon, uh, goal being that uh, kind of late in the game, we realize there's about 100 million tons probably at least of water buried in the regolith and the cold traps of the, the south pole of the moon. So water is is water, it's oxygen, and it's rocket fuel. It's hydrogen and, and uh, oxygen, which is uh, a great rocket fuel, and that hydrogen would be uh, the perfect thing for us to use to, to uh, refuel the tanks on the Vasmir rocket that will take crews to Mars. But fundamentally, Going to the moon on a permanent basis where you actually learn to live off the land is a crucial skill. You're a couple of days away from planet Earth. And uh, so if something happens, uh, you, you, you're, you're close to home plate and there's always a board capability. But we, we have tremendous resources there in a very shallow gravity well relative to the gravity well of planet Earth. So taking advantage of that is going to be key. We want to see more of these. We'd like to see one with kind of an orange hue as well. And this is the plan that NASA's laid out between now and 2024. So a gateway space, sta space station orbit around the moon is the target. And from there, we would start staging uh, landers uh, to that South Pole site, and that eventually a, a gateway itself would be aggregated and grown. So the, the, you'll see a lot of different things with regarding capability at the bottom that talks about the, the critical capability that NASA wants that includes living off the land and, and uh, being able to, uh, to, to use that water. And, and also, it's a pretty harsh place to, to, as a test bed, a test environment for the hardware that you'd want to send to Mars. So it's a great way to ring that out. So uh, Artemis 1 would be the first uh, crew to, uh, or the first mission to the, uh, actually, sorry, Artemis 1 is the uncrewed version. Artemis 2 is the one in 2024 to the South Pole. This is uh, the miniature version of Space Station. The target, you know, Space Station Gateway was going to be a larger affair. Uh, the thought now is that we'd actually be able to just fly up a propulsion element and a, uh, and a miniature habitation module, which are kind of to the right there, that gold one is the propulsion ele element and the habitation modules there. The lander is that piece that's up in the uh, uh, upper upward side of the right. We bring crews to and from the gateway in the, in the Orion spacecraft in the, uh, the lower right, and then we'd stage those uh, landings to the surface of the moon. By going there and having a gateway station, it allows 
allows you to reuse at least the ascent stage. If you are able to do, land at the exact same places, you can go and every descent stage that you leave on the moon can form the basis for a gradually accumulating uh, capability of resources down there. But then you can recover the ascent stage to the gateway, bring another crew up in Orion, and then, uh, and then use that same ascent, or, or, or bring a descent stage up and then be able to, to, uh, to get down there. So there's lots of launches. This would be that Artemis II mission. Gateway in its uh, later uh, configurations as we gradually add more international partner elements. And then ultimately this would be the view from that South Pole location with, with Earth low on the horizon. And then after the, uh, the initial gateway missions, there's uh, the, the idea of getting into further and further sustained capability with ultimately the moon being, or the Mars being the, uh, the goal that we want to go to. So I, I think I probably used all the time and more than I had, so with that. So, so I think what we'll do is we'll take a quick break right now, and then uh, we've got a live stream that'll be coming up of the uh, of the preparations, the final preparations, and the launch of the uh, of the Soyuz with the Expedition uh, 60 crew. So they're going to launch at 12:38. We'll we'll be back here at about 12:30, and we'll kind of talk through and watch those final preparations and and watch the crew as they head uphill. So thank you. <laughs>